everybody. My name is Neat Comet and I am going to a meeting. Well, actually an interview with you won't believe me who the original bassist for the band Suicidal Tendencies, whose name is Luigi Mayorga and he co-wrote almost all the biggest hits of the band. So this is really exciting. We got him to talk to me and he invited us to his own place. This is super exciting. And I, I'm actually a little bit nervous, which you can tell because interviews is not the thing that I usually do. So uh, let's see. Come on, we're very close. Just making sure it looks skinny, go ahead. <laughs> hey, I'm still getting that tattoo, the one you have right there, the red one. Uh, the, the yes, one. right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, nice. That's like a good thing, right? It's a good energy type. Yeah, that was my initial idea for this tattoo, actually. So you guys came together? Yeah. From Russia? Yeah. Aww. <laughs> Husband and wife, yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Nika Comet, and this is 20 Minutes Date with Luigi Mayorga from Suicidal Tendencies, you guys. And Horny Toad. Horny Toad was my other big band for 30 years oh. after Suicide. We'll get, into See, that later. Yes. we'll get into that later. You will have to tell me about that because I'm not from here. And uh, my knowledge of the Los Angeles music scene, especially of, you know, that time is very um, segregated. Can I say that about mm -hmm. knowledge? Yeah. Okay, well, I mean. so there we go. I'm super excited, guys, because, uh, well, some of you might know Suicidal Tendencies is an exceptionally iconic band. And... Uh, and this this uh, amazing person right here wrote some uh, songs some good stuff. for them. Yes, yeah. exactly. Okay, I'm gonna. I, I should stop no, talking. No, and, no, 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 no. I, I gotta um, ask you what you. Uh, so yeah. what's exciting for me here is okay. that you guys are also from Venice Beach, and this is where we are. This is very special because it's that famous part of Los Angeles. So um, I know that you you were born and raised here. So I was conceived in that house next door. Oh, lived man. there till I was six, and then my dad had the other house next door. Yeah, so we had three houses in a row. That's my awesome. daddy owned those two, and then my grandma owned this one, and then he sold that a long time ago. Oh. But yeah, they born and raised. I was born in Santa Monica because Venice didn't have a hospital. We still don't have our own hospital here in Venice, but yeah. What was Venice like when you were a kid, and uh, why is it so iconic? Why does everybody... The neighborhood, know? right? Yeah. So back in the old, like in the 60s and the 70s, you had, what, the, you had the P.O.P., Ocean, Pacific Ocean Park was a big amusement park on the beach with rides over the, going over the water. It was gnarly, right? And they had venues, they had like, you know, the big band era was back then, and it was just a cool place. And it's a part of LA, this is part, you know, Venice is part of LA, and it's LA's beach, which is LA's the biggest f town in or county, this side of, uh, you know, the southern part of right. California. So it's big. And this Venice was super cool. But like in the old, like when I was a little kid, it was all about like Dogtown skates and uh, surfers and music. The Doors was representing, you know what I'm saying? And uh, um, it's, it's just a and badass. And you know, it's the second behind maybe, or the first biggest tourist spot in the country behind Disneyland, you know? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's number one or number two. I mean, everybody wants it. And it's five blocks away that way. So. <laughs> So yeah, so it's just a cool place. Just like and I said, all the music and the scene and so this... everybody was hanging out here in these bars, mm -hmm. and so you were able to actually go and meet. Well, I was sneaking in. I was when I was not. I was younger, and um, yeah, there was one club on Main Street. It was called Blackies. Uh, there was no shops open. It was it was like everything was closed just because the, the tough times. But that one club stayed open, and I was like thirteen, sneaking in, and my cousin was playing drums. Who's he was a played with the Dickies, he played with the Blasters, he played with Carol King, he's played with everybody. I just looked up to him when I was a kid. And I snuck backstage, I'm like, man, I wanna be, I wanna be a rocker too. Cause I couldn't skate, I couldn't surf, to save my life, you know what I'm saying? But as soon as I started hanging out with my friends, I was 13 and started playing music. Then you started playing bass right away. Bass and guitar at the same time, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And I was getting invited to finally go to some parties and play. So I, that was my little in for this little social scene down here at the beach. Uh, my older brother was a gangster. He was a killer. He got killed like a month before my Suicidal Tennessee's album came out. Oh. He was a shot caller here in the neighborhood. This was a real bad neighborhood back in the day. He was all blacks and Mexicans. And if you're white, you, you had to be a badass motherfucker because uh, it wasn't just for, you can just come walk in the streets. Everybody knew their place. Right now it's all, we were in Venice, you know, everyone, they walk in front of your car, they don't give a but, the new people, but the new people. They would still come hang out 
uh, on the boardwalk and yeah. in Venice. If they wouldn't really come over here like in the 80s and the 90s. There was big wars between Cover, you know, Cover City or Santa Monica or Shoreline Crips, the blacks, and people were getting killed. This, it was empty. The streets were empty. They called this neighborhood Ghost Town. It's a mile square from Rose right behind us, two blocks over, to California, to Lincoln, to the beach. There's a one square mile. And that, the neighborhood was, like in the prison system, was known for being extremely violent, hard, and um, no half step. And you know what that means? No half step, like, I'm almost a gangster, or uh, I'm hanging out with these guys. And I'm, no, you, if you said you were from Venice, my brother was a shot caller, and it was like later on I found out, like, they would tell me, like, uh, my brother would say, like, where you from? And they would say, Venice, he would show me. Go show me. Oh, wow. And to be a click member, I assume you had to kill somebody. I, that's just what I heard, you know, you had to kill someone to be in the click, you know what I'm saying? And you're untouchable, you know, back then. I wasn't trying to be no killer. I was the youngest. I had another brother, because he was 13 years older than me, the gangster. And then I had another brother that was nine years older than me. He went to UC UCSB and graduated college, and he was like, you know, killing people, bringing heroin over the border in Tijuana. So I was like, what do I want to be? Do I want to go to college or do I? I th in hindsight, I think they were trying to expose me to they're both, you know, the way they live and come on to a brother, we're gonna do we'll do this, we're gonna do that. But I, I, I didn't like neither. So I mean so I was glad to find my friend a musician and that was it. And I went and saw that movie The Song Remains the Same by Led Zeppelin. I remember walking out going, Oh like I knew my purpose, you know what I mean? I wasn't trying to kill nobody. And I wasn't trying to go to college. So I just kept myself in the loop with all these musicians. And you know, that's how, and, and then at one point, you know, my first little band uh, was called High Voltage. It had future members of Soul Cell Tendencies. It was Grant Estes, the guitar player, Mike Clark, the guitar player, and moi. It was like, to me, a West Side modern day of the Yardbirds, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and all those dudes playing together, you know what I mean? So you, you were a teen, and you got into music. How, because I know you knew Mike from, like, Mm -hmm. school and then mm -hmm. how did it happen that you guys um, you know created this tandem how did your creative process work like how did you so do it so you want me to ask the answer the first part about how we met and please well, because we were friends in the ninth grade his church was right behind my house on third street his church was, was a mormon church on second street so the ninth grade we're friends we you know we're, we're acquaintances we're not like chum chum he was you know we're different we all had different friends and circles and and then we go. To, I go to Samuel High, you know, tenth grade, high school. Uh, we were on the same football team. If you look at our football team photos, we're all there: me, Mike, R.J. Herrera, Kevin Gershow from No Mercy. I don't know if you heard of them. I was first string, uh, offensive tackle. Mike was second string. And in high school, you know what I mean? I was just like, like a week and a half. I didn't go to practice. I didn't go to practice. What I'm doing? I don't know what I'm doing, but I just didn't do it for a week and a half. And then when I came back, guess who took my spot? First thing, Mike got my spot. I mean, I deserved it. I mean, I was I left. I wasn't going to practice. It's a cool little story because he stopped going to school in midway through 11th grade. And the talk was that he's in this punk rock band and there was no punkers in that school. There was three punkers. And they were, they were the ones uh, that did um, We Got Power magazine, that little film production. They're known in the punk world. They hung out with Black Flag from the very beginning. And... Uh, I throw a bubble gum at him. I hate that. Mm -hmm. They got him have a little to do shit like that. Anyway, so I graduate high school. So I just get in line at SMC to uh, you know enroll, and who's standing standing right in front of me is Mike. He's got his three paper clips in his ear, shaved head, you know boots, one one dark boot, one old boot with metal hanging out of it, punker. You know what I mean? Like, hey, I'm cool. Now I've been a musician strong five years, you know what I mean? I've been playing, playing with all these diff different motherfuckers. I, I was frustrated because my main crew of dudes I was jamming with, the high voltage guys, we were getting older. You know, it was turning out to be like more of a jam band. We played Freebird, you know, the, the lead part, Freebird, down, down, 45 minutes. Gotcha. So they can practice their leads and me the ding dong. But I look at it now, I'm like, that really helped me out with my timing right. and accents and whatever. But I'd be like, oh, and I'd try to switch it around or whatever. With Grant Estes, the lead guitar player. So we were talking, and then and his first question was, do you use your pinky, you know, on your left hand? I go, yeah. I go, okay, boom. And so that day we had a 
audition. Wow, look at that. <laughs> what? This is just like one of the weirdest questions. What? I mean, to to accept a person in the band. You know, if they're cool, they're cool. It doesn't matter what fingers they use or not, or how many no, no, strings okay, he they was have. Because it's mixed volume section. He had guys that were that were just, some were barely learning their instruments. Yeah. And so I'm doing the song, I think I, I remember doing, like, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Suicidal Favorite. And then from the corner of my eye, I busted him going, and I was like, oh. nice. And it was a, a, a black cat, cool black cat that I know. He was he was going in there to also do his interview, but I got the point. So, and the Dunnigan brothers, you know, they had that little chemistry of writing, you know, slow and then fast and then slow again and whatever. So that helped me learn like institutionalized slow, fast. So meeting him in line at the college, that was the start, the beginning of it all. With me and so some senses. That's that's awesome. And then um, writing together to me as as a songwriter, that feels like a very difficult thing because you have to leave your ego outside, as we say, and do what's best for the song. Everyone's different, but that's a different approach on your way. So the way we did it back then was, I believe, and the way, actually I know the way we did it back then was like. Um, I would write a song and take it to him, and then we would like it, put it in the mix while we're practicing, and Mike never practiced. And we didn't know what he was singing to our music until the day we were all in the studio and recording. We were actually talking about that when we were listening to the lyrics of uh, Institutionalized, mm -hmm. and Alex was like, oh my god, I wonder how he would repeat all that, because that totally feels like an improv. Yeah, but it, it, he had the gist of it down. What happened was, it was a little kid that went up and was telling Mike the story. Mike took the story and made it his own. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It was a kid's story that somebody told him, hey man, this is what's going on. That's why it's so raw. It has this yeah. nerve. nerve and feeling and emotion. Yeah, yeah, and Glenn Freeman, who produced it, I don't like the cat too much, and he knows why I don't like him. But uh, uh, he really pushed Mike vocally. Mm -hmm. You know, do it again, do this, do that. I just remember, like, how do you know you take pictures? You know what I'm saying? I mean, he got, he pushed Mike. That's and that's why it's so damn good. Takes you from you know from where you are and puts you in this state of mind and emotion. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what a good producer would do, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's great. What do you think is the hardest in the creative process, and uh, how did you fight burnout? Did it ever happen to you, like, creatively, when you felt that you don't have inspiration, that you don't want to practice, that you don't want to be in a band anymore? Well, for one, and I still have that f***ing, still to this day, uh, that same energy of like picking up my guitar and if I take a couple of little hits of weed I can be there for three hours and I'm you know recording sh hooks and riffs I call it hooks and riffs for, for the future use so I'll go back if I get a deal or you know they come every few years and I have to do an album I'll go through my sh I'm like I'm taking this I'm taking that and I'll, I'll just build on it you know um, yeah and this is amazing advice for anybody who is uh, creating music you have to have something in your stash, always. Catalog. Yeah, and I say hooks and riffs, and I say that as a, a student of Led Zeppelin and, and Jimmy Page, the has so many hooks and riffs. A lot of people don't like them, I don't care, but like this they can write, you know what I'm saying? Like the intro to it, and then just come out with the verse and whatever, and that's how I learned to write brass T. I just sped it up. This is rock and roll sped up. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if it's an uncomfortable question. Let me know if so. Uh, so are you, how are you now with Mike? We don't talk. Oh, okay. He's, he's off to bigger and better things. I felt a lot of hatred and just a lot of whatever, but I'm not like, he's obviously won the game because me and him, at one point he was all like, this is our band. We're going to own the name and blah, blah, blah. Because I was writing all the shit. He was writing the shit. I thought it was good. You know what I mean? So yeah, so guys... we don't get along anymore and uh, whatever. Maybe one day. Uh... Did you guys do anything you know like copyright songs right away or like did you did you just sign with the label and they had to take care of that yeah because uh i mean when we were struggling and or whatever i was like playing with these other bands back then how we did it was 
you put it on a cassette. This is the '80s, right? You put it in a cassette, you put it in an envelope, and you mail it to yourself, like proof that it was. Right. You also know, you take that to court. But now there's other ways of doing it. I'm sure the internet. But now we, you know, I just go through the label, and they, you know, it's all pub, you know, my publishing, and I'm with Sony In Grooves right now, so automatically my taken care of, protected, yeah, and and, yeah. and they. And uh, to license it out, they get their little chip, and I get my chip, you know, money. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But yeah, I don't, you know, I, I really don't deal with that. Happening. Because nowadays, I don't know if you know that, but independent musicians, you know, since uh, the industry has changed so much, um, independent musicians have to take care of it themselves, you know, and uh, a lot of them... What, when the they, copywriting? Yeah, and uh, the royalties and everything, and especially, you know, it becomes difficult when a few songwriters collaborate on a song. Yeah. How, how to determine who wrote what, if it all came together... Well, if, first of all, if you guys are friends, and you're true blue friends, and you can say, hey, like, you know, I did all the lyrics, you did all the music, and Johnny Joe... Did a cool part of the guitar that you know whatever it's just the go just you know 40 40 20 or you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's yeah. easy just, just discuss just, it right away yeah right? We'll discuss it right away and put it on paper if the song hits and hits big you're gonna be glad you did that you know what i'm saying oh totally but unfortunately you know you're still with me today sometimes do something and nothing you know the music isn't the same the industry isn't or whatever isn't the same so it's a lot harder and i hate the music industry the business I don't understand it that well. I hate it, and uh, but yeah, that's why I got people that help me do it, and I'm yeah. blessed in that's that good. way. That's good. So um, I feel like in the band, on the band scene, the hardest thing is when you have a falling out with your band members, uh -huh. right? And then you still in the band. Like for example, the Ramones played for years. They didn't even talk, you know, between each other. So did you guys have a falling out, like? after you left or did no, you I mean, have to go through that? When I was gone, I was gone. I got dissed, disrespected, but I wanted to be back in the band, but it wasn't going to happen, so. Oh, I, I see. And we were roommates. We lived in the same house. We had a skateboard shop underneath. Oh, no. I was pretty bummed. Oh, I bet. Long face, you know, it took my identity away because this is like, you know, my neighborhood. It was right before April Fool, so it was like everyone thought I was doing an April Fool. Yeah, right, April Fool. I was like, no, fool. I got kicked the f out. It really f with my head. It took years and years to get over. And um, I let him deal with all the business. And, and of course, you know, he butt me off some shit. They gave me, you know, I, I signed a deal with Epic a week later, I get kicked out. But in that, before I signed that thing, we had just picked up Mike Clark on guitar. So I had to show him all the songs, my songs. But it would have been cool if he would have talked to me like a, like a homeboy, like we were doing dirt together. That never crossed my mind getting kicked out. I just thought that we were so fucking close and, I, you know, we had shit on each other. I know, you know, we all know. What, you could have talked to me like a friend. Right. Or a bro hey man, you're, you're slipping. Stop yeah. doing that. But that's, I feel like that's the hardest thing to tell a musician that you don't well, agree what's going on. Well, it's more harder when you kick them out. Oh, you totally. Know. But if yeah. you think about it, me and him were tops of the band. It was a financial gain for him also. Gotcha. And then he was trying to run his I think like Ozzy Osbourne, just the next bass player that comes in, he ain't split. Right, a show. Right. Now it's getting, I don't know, between fifteen and forty thousand dollars a show. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what he's fight paying them like five hundred on a good day each. He gets the rest. Yeah. So uh, what are you up to now? What are your I'm musical with projects? This guy who looks bored as hell. <laughs> uh, it's like he wants to jump off a bridge. <laughs> and uh, no, don't judge by his face. His oh, face do, is I, often like I this. I do judge. Just, <laughs> I'm an old cat, you know what I'm saying? Uh, I'm a good listener. <laughs> so uh, you're playing with Test Human, and then there's your band, Lucidal. Lucidal and Horny Toad. We do good around here, but like, Horny Toad is like, because it's like, really girl friendly. Girls go to our shows. Okay. And they dance, instead of slam pitting and all that. How would you like that? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I mean, sometimes I would get in trouble, like, I couldn't look over there, I couldn't look over there, I couldn't look over there while I'm playing because they're all they're all looking like we're leaving after the show together. So I ain't looking at no one so I'm playing like this and I have to sneak out sometimes. I just love it. Horny Toes are a really fun band. I got in that band in 89, right after ST. And uh, it was a whole totally different writing mm -hmm. experience. I started writing with minors, you know, playing the minor chords. The bass wired down like James Brown funk to like, you know, like a Bob Marley bass. Or like I, I can do things and hit soft instead of being so aggressive with a pick and, 
and hit gnarly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. This is more tender shit. And I had it on because it's the rock and roll, the everything. A lot of bands, punk rock bands, started when they started the band when they started playing the instrument. And uh, now nah, I was already five years deep, which was was everything. Because when I joined that band, ST, and I busted the guys behind me going, like, this because all that experience. You know? I mean, yeah. I had to take the bus all the way to Hollywood. Yeah, I just wanted to play. Couldn't get laid <laughs> in high school to save my life. I have no game. <laughs> so all I had was the bass, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we understand that. Uh, there's there's still people out there every year who, you know, just fall in love with their instrument and with music, with did. bands and this whole culture. And I feel like what we can do as musicians, as independent musicians nowadays, is try to save that culture because it has this specific taste and I have fascination because I remember being in a band just like you, you know, and just being like, yeah, it doesn't matter if they pay me, I just want to play. That happens getting old and you got to pay bills and <laughs> I'm sick and tired of you. Yeah, so uh, what advice would you give young musicians and people who fell in love with this band culture and want, believe that they can tour? And... Change the world. Yeah. I always have a plan B. I never did that. But there's so many other cool things just playing music, you know what I mean? Artistically, like building or... I mean, I got some friends that like they're builders, like Robert Trujillo from Metallica. And then...